For some reason that we'll probably never fully understand, an extraordinary outpouring of energy began to occur around the year 1100. It was so powerful and so passionate that it transformed the way the world looked and thought about God, about justice and power, about women, love and art. This story starts with the almost unbelievable life of the woman we will come to know as Eleanor of Aquitaine. Eleanor had virtually everything this life can grant. Sunlit beauty, inherited power and wealth on a phenomenal scale. Kings as husbands, kings as sons. She lived an epic life in the middle of a whirlwind. Entangled with five mightily powerful men who fought for more than a century to control Western Europe. Surrounding them is an incredible array of people who lived in that world doing incredible things, from building stone cathedrals that streamed with sunlight, to fighting two crusades, to inventing fictional characters we still read about. We know of only a few of them, and what we do know of even these favoured few is limited by their records and our own comprehension. Come with us as we journey to meet Eleanor of Aquitaine, Henry Plantagenet, Richard Lionheart, King John, and all the remarkable people surrounding them. To be in their presence is an exhilarating experience. Won't you join us? Welcome back to Lion's Forge. My name is Beckett, and I want to tell you a story, an epic true story of five kings and the Lion Queen. Episode 5, O oh, Paris. The year is 1143. When we left our last episode, Alionor of Aquitaine and Louis Capet of France had just married and, mere weeks later, inherited the French throne. He was 17, she a mere 13. They had unparalleled wealth thanks to her fortune and they had considerable respect thanks to his father. And they had the great advantage of the aid and counsel of Abbot Suger, one of the truly extraordinary people of his day. Suger's rise from an uncelebrated birth to a seat beside the King of France is fair evidence of how remarkable his era was. If you could make up a lack of inherited family grandeur with intelligence, energy, charisma, and luck, you could rise high in the medieval firmament, your opinions sought, and quips repeated by kings, dukes, and popes. His family, probably country manor folk, had sent their little boy to a monastery to make his way in life. The monastery was called Saint Denis de l'Estrie, built along the old Roman road that ran north from Paris. Legend had it that St. Denis had been a missionary to the Gauls in the 3rd century, when Rome still powered the gears of European government. As happened to many others, Denis' Christian preaching eventually led to his martyrdom. This was something of an undertaking in his case, as supposedly the poor fellow was first burned, then thrown to wild beasts, and then with what one feels had to be serious exasperation on the Roman side, baked in a good-sized oven. Nor did he die until he was finally beheaded, and even after that, the wonderfully resilient saint dusted himself off, retrieved his head, and walked several miles. A church was built on the site of his final steps. By the time Suger was there, the Priory of Saint-Denis had been established for hundreds of years and was a favorite of French kings, who often were educated and almost inevitably buried within its walls. Young Suger's intelligence was apparently recognized very quickly. He spent the next 15 years in Saint-Denis' schoolroom rather than hoeing weeds in the monastery garden. At 25, he became secretary to the abbot of St. Denis, an important young aide to the most important man at one of the two or three most important churches in France. He was described as small and ugly, with wretched health, but it didn't matter. 
Suger possessed in abundance the skills that come when intelligence and clear thinking are happily allied with energetic determination. Men of power recognized his ability, liked and trusted him, and accordingly moved him up and up the ladder of medieval government. His talents were brought to the attention of King Louis VI, who appointed him to two tours of duty as a provost for the crown, a responsible position that combined authority over tax collection with the role of local judge. A decade later, he was sent as royal ambassador to the courts of two successive popes, one of whom saw Suger as a potential cardinal, a prince of the Catholic Church. He lived to be 70, spending his entire life managing people and running things. Starting as a simple Benedictine monk, he would end as abbot of St. Denis, as well as senior advisor to both Louis VI and his son Louis Capet. Popes and kings both thought him invaluable. One can see why. A devout and devoted churchman, Suger believed with his entire being that a king stood at the apex of humanity, a vassal of God alone, liege lord to the teeming ranks below him. And he mightily loved the Capets. As he had served the father until his death, he now served the son, whom he called the hope of the good and the terror of the wicked. Craving Capetian dominance in a turbulent world, Suger had been much in favor of Louis Capet's marriage to Eleanor, that most nobly born girl who brought with her the incomparable dowry of the Aquitaine. Suger's life, however, was not simply one of long days hunched over sheets of royal parchment. Austerity was not in his makeup. The chalice he used at Mass, which we still have in the possession of the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., is gorgeous. A gilded cup of incredibly fine workmanship, rubies and pearls caught in a net of golden filigree. And when he undertook the renovation of the decrepit 365-year-old Cathedral of St. Denis, Suger poured timber, limestone, gold, and precious stones into his cherished project, wanting to enable men who saw it to forget their earthly troubles so they could concentrate on their God. He lavished the space with twenty glittering altars, not to mention a crucifix three times the height of a man made entirely of jewel-encrusted gold. Building the place obviously thrilled him. He talks in his memoirs of how he joined his carpenters at dawn to hurry to the building site to ensure that beams were being measured accurately. Having decided his shabby old church needed work, Suger also thought he might try out a few ideas he'd been mulling over. These ideas, about what sunlight meant in terms of God, eternity, and the human soul, were turned unforgettably to stone. We call this thinking Gothic architecture. To this day, we feel we've encountered something very special when we're fortunate enough to come into its presence. Suger's passion to convey the meaning of the light of God evidently captured a universal ageless yearning for this new St. Denis style mushroomed across Europe in the following decades. To this very day, we can't have enough windows in our walls. When the modern wing of the Art Institute of Chicago opened, essentially a building of shimmering glass, film shows people thronging the hallways, gazing up toward the sunlit ceiling, awestruck even in the 21st century. 12th century Parisians, who had never seen sunlight indoors absent some household calamity, must have streamed toward Suger's astounding new cathedral, fascinated, delighted, volunteering to help build it, believing themselves fortunate to play a part in the recreation of that first day when God granted light to the earth. Still, despite Suger's fantastic creativity, the Paris young Louis and Eleanor ruled in the 1140s was barely changed at all from the dank and dreary place a Russian princess named Anna had wept about in letters home after her marriage to a Frankish king 90 years before. 
Andrew Hussey, an historian of the city, describes the place as a filthy, stinking swamp, home to animals, dung, and sagging wooden walls. Just what it may have been like comes alive in the description of life hundreds of years later in post-Civil War Nashville, Tennessee, even after urban life had reaped the benefits of centuries of civic improvements. The author, a local citizen, wrote winningly that horses and mules, the main source of transportation, produced enormous quantities of manure and thousands of gallons of urine every day, pounding it into the streets with their hooves and wagon wheels. Combined with garbage, privy fumes, and the contribution of assorted dogs, chickens, and hogs, the whole array created an abominable stench. Dead animals were left in the streets for days before being dragged to the river by the city scavengers. Hot weather was almost unendurable. The young Queen Eleanor, who had been raised amidst the easy luxury of the Aquitaine, where warmth, poetry, wine, and lavish tables were the norm, would now spend her days in the terribly old city palace. Built as a slit-windowed fortress in the middle of the Seine lifetimes ago, it no doubt satisfied every suspicion we hold that medieval castles were dark, cold, and mildewed. Nor would the parsimonious and austere capes be the ones to spring for mitigating luxuries. Living in it had to be as unglamorous as it was uncomfortable. Eleanor would be dead before her husband's son and heir, Philip Augustus, was so nauseated by the stench of his capital city that he demanded a better system. His engineers connected drains to wooden pipes to carry off the piss and rotting garbage everyone simply tossed down to the streets. Well, we essentially do the same thing ourselves, although vastly advantaged by running water and sewage treatment plants. Still, dirty, stinking, verminous, mud caked, and wind swept as it was, 12th century Paris a city throbbing through the days and into the nights with cries and confusion, was not without its pleasures. A friend of the chronicler John of Salisbury later recalled with evident delight his memory of the place. O oh, Paris, he wrote, suave and agreeable, an abundance of all good things, gay streets, rare food, incomparable wine. Chapels and convents were everywhere, a hundred opportunities to open one's soul to God, tended by monks, veiled nuns, and clerks, swarmed by penitents in rough clothing with ashes on their heads, and by beggars with sores on their lips. Pyramids of ale casks, piles of timber, donkey carts crinking down the middle of every street created obstacles at every turn. Markets spilled out cabbages, chickens, apples, wine, piglets, firewood. Gangs of students surged across the city, laughing as they argued in the streets whether a tunic red on one side and blue on the other was red or blue. People gossiped, slapped at fleas, and flirted at the municipal fountains while they did their laundry and filled their water urns, or stopped at the central square where public announcements and sermons gave everyone something satisfyingly new to talk about. Someone had worked at creating a royal garden, where we would not feel at all out of place. Flowers and herbs familiar to us were loved in Eleanor's day and planted with abandon, although not so neatly as in our more orderly world. Holly and elegant bay trees were mixed with the upright, airy, colorful things we call lavender, bee balm, delphinium, pretty sky-blue borage, foxglove, dill, columbine, nasturtium, the sages and the jade green mints, the clustered purple caps known as monkshood. Shrub roses, the gallicas, with their bosomy flowers in shades of deep crimson and violet were admired for their intense perfume. White-flowered angelica grew six feet tall, Filled with songbirds nestling in the ivy and the sounds of church bells carried by the breeze, gardens would be lovely, restful places to walk the paths or sit on little seats made of mossy-mounded earth and forget about the rest of the world. Of course, everyone watched Suger's jaw-dropping renovation of Saint-Denis. 
Workers from all parts of Europe mobbed the town, wearing what Parisians would have found odd clothing, eating their smelly foreign foods, cutting stone blocks the size of carts, or laying mosaics so small that diligent labor might yield inches of progress in a month. Great stone walls went up, experimentally buttressed by even more stone. Consider how these 12th century men, lacking much except chisels and levers and muscle power, built these things, trying new engineering ideas driven by new thinking about the possible. If we could somehow watch them work, we'd be dazzled even today. Now imagine that you live your life in a wooden hut. There's a hole in the roof to haphazardly draw smoke from the fire burning in the middle of your floor, provided it's not windblown or raining. Out doing errands, dodging the miry bits where the horses peed, you turn a corner on a Parisian street made of dirt and the day's garbage, and suddenly come face to face with great gaping holes smashed through walls of solid stone. Praying in darkness, the habit of a thousand years, was ending before your eyes. God, once infinitely far away, was now at your side. It was an exciting time to be alive. The streets had to be mobbed. It's been calculated that 2,000 people considered Paris home, living in the open more than they lived in their choking tenements. They would be selling candles, buying pork, arguing, laughing, shouting at children chasing dogs, airing old furs, whipping cart horses, offering open bowls of cider for sampling, starting out on pilgrimage, cutting stone, carrying baskets piled with the most popular of snacks, the turnovers called pasties, that were filled with anything and everything, from eels to cheese. On Saturdays, you could stroll around to the old cathedral of Notre Dame, washed by the ripples of the Seine, and talk to the alchemists hard at it in the plaza. Everyone wandered the river's banks, kicking their way through the goats and the boatmen hauling firewood and salt. The free-spirited canines of the day, not shackled by leashes and collars, would have shared the streets with geese, pigs, horses, donkeys, cats, rats, mice, chickens, and sheep, all merrily going about their lives if they weren't being determinedly pulled to the butcher. To add to the riotous energy, students were everywhere, drawn by the growing reputation of Paris as a university town. John of Salisbury, who would become one of the most important chroniclers of his era, was there along with Thomas Beckett, who one day would be immortal. They were there because brilliant teachers were there, chief among them Peter Abelard, a sublime star of that universe. Abelard was already legendary, then and even now. We still know, at least vaguely, who he was, the lover of the young Heloise, castrated for his passion. There has been something in the story of Abelard and Heloise for everyone. Depending on the audience, this fated couple can represent the shattering power of impassioned love, the tragic wages of sin, womanly devotion, female victimization, and or the sexually repressive power of the church, an asexuality not exactly obvious to contemporaries. In our era, which has edged away from crazy passion that might limit one's options in life, the whole thing sounds mad, but it's still irresistible. The two met in 1117, not long after Dangerous and William IX of the Aquitaine collided. Abelard was 38, already considered, by himself as well as others, brilliant, a groundbreaking thinker, a professor so popular students hiked halfway across Europe to hear him lecture. One can understand why the youth of his day would love him. He thought like a young man, absolutely delighted to take on the powers that be. Very briefly put, he stood for the fascinating new proposition that all human actions, including worshipping God, could, indeed should, be considered rationally, not simply on the basis of faith. He didn't fear doubt. He embraced it, arguing that human reason, too, was a gift from God. 
Many of us today would nod our agreement with the principle that seems self-evident to us, but in his day, his thinking was revolutionary, startling, frighteningly close to blasphemy. Abelard's fame, like a rock star's, was a mix of equal parts charisma, talent, and delight in shocking the authorities. Here was a man willing to debate the sinfulness of crucifying Christ if the Romans believed they were doing the right thing, a point of view so radical even we might hesitate to take it on. Heloise, in turn, was altogether desirable, an intelligent, educated, and beautiful young woman, seriously intending to be a philosopher rather than anyone's wife. She had already earned some fame thanks to her thoughtful writing. She was only some 16 years old. It still can happen. Brilliant professor, brilliant student, mental and then physical sparks. We do wince at his later admission that he set out to seduce her when she was just a girl, although she volleys back that she gloried in winning the attentions of the great Abelard. A year later, in 1118, Heloise was pregnant and would give birth to a son later lost to history. She and Abelard were duly married, but her furious uncle took his family's bloody revenge. People could not stop talking about it, and we can hardly blame them. Nine hundred years on, it remains one of the most riveting love stories in European history. By the time Eleanor and Louis ruled Paris, it had been twenty years since those storied days of rebellious tragedy and star-crossed passion. Abelard was still in town, one of the most famous men alive, teaching his revolutionary beliefs about human logic to enraptured students, women as well as men, at the famous University of Paris. In good weather, they might be allowed the use of the royal garden, jostling for intellectual supremacy under the chestnut trees. Heloise had given birth to their son many years before, after which she became a nun, a startling turn in our eyes since she was both married and a mother. Her brilliance never dimmed. She rose to new honor as the prioress of a Benedictine convent a hundred miles away from the man who was still her husband. For his part, Abelard had his own fresh troubles, largely in the person of another famous churchman we'll meet soon, Bernard of Clairvaux, the foe of a lifetime. How the two fought across the pulpits and lecterns of Paris over whether Bernard's faith or Abelard's reason was supreme. Bernard complained bitterly to the Pope that Abelard defines faith as private judgment, as though everyone is allowed to think and speak as he pleases. Abelard would collapse and die a few years later, on his way to Rome to argue against Bernard's charges that he was a heretic. Heloise would live on for another quarter century. As for Louis Capet and Eleanor, their marriage is so colored by what eventually happened to them, the entirety of the disaster captured by Eleanor supposedly commenting, I had thought to marry a king, but found instead that I married a monk. It's commonly thought that the quote-unquote monk was awed by her vivid mind and her beauty, while she was unimpressed by this quiet, former seminarian who had spent his childhood learning to be a priest. He was intelligent, but did not come from a family inclined to sit before a roaring fire and listen to music or debate philosophy. And he was so cautious, often hesitant, his mood vacillating between indecision and acts of violent retribution. Some say that he cried rather often. His court, like his father's, was so parsimonious, so dour, as the French historian Jean Dunbabin labels it, that Louis lived with the certainty that no one stalked him for his wealth. During his ill-fated crusade, he probably saved his own life by dressing like a common foot soldier. Eleanor, on the other hand, was a noblewoman born and bred, the child of a bawdy, swaggering, and wealthy family which had never shown itself overly inclined to the careful, bourgeois virtues of sobriety, duty, and dogged effort. 
This was a lady used to the varied stimulations of the lavish and lively Aquitanian court at Poitiers, where it was said that once they settle down to rest in peace, they give themselves up entirely to enjoyment. They probably understood each other very little. Louis and Eleanor were no Duke William and Dangereux, no Philip and his Bertrade. They did not even rise to the mark set by Eleanor's father, William X, and his wife, the little unwanted Eleanor. Whatever level of youthful hormones drove our royals after their wedding, their first child would not be born for eight years until Eleanor was at least 20 years old. The baby simply had to be a son, but instead, their first child was a girl. William IX's dynastic game had already been in play for nearly a decade. We've come to the end of our story for the time being. I am Beckett Arnold, narrating from the book Lion's Forge by Karen Markle Knapp, soon to be available at Amazon Books. Don't forget, if you like what you hear, please give us a thumbs up, save us as a favorite, and share us with your friends. Most importantly, please join us again in two weeks for the next episode of Lion's Forge, available everywhere you get your favorite podcast.